Welcome to The Real Story with Jeannie Ives. Today's segment, I'm going to cover a couple of interesting things. First of all, Lori Lightfoot started her own Chicago water. Oh, that's interesting considering that you can't drink the water in at least 400,000 households in the city. But hey, let's talk about that a little bit further. Uh, next, we're going to talk about energy. And again, you know, now getting national attention from the Wall Street Journal and other publications is the fact that MISO is expecting to have rolling blackouts. MISO is the energy source for central and southern Illinoisans. But, you know, Pritzker and the Democrats completely disregarded that that would happen. And then finally, we're going to talk about crime, uh, the tragic, tragic killing of a young man in Chicago. But it's not just happening in Chicago, folks. It's everywhere. And I've got a story to share with you from Springfield, Illinois. Before we begin with our first topic in this segment, I want to again thank the sponsors of our Breakthrough Ideas dinner and discussion that's happening this Friday night. By the way, we already all are sold out. Uh, but uh, we want to thank, first of all, netmotorcars.com and Michael Colby there. They have a 30,000 square foot showroom. They can help with any of your financing needs as well. So please visit netmotorcars.com and talk to Michael Colby. He'll take care of all of your needs. And then secondly, we want to thank our sponsors, which is um, Kai's Restaurant. They're the Glendale Heights Restaurant right there on North Avenue. Remember uh, Mr. Kai, uh, the Kai's Restaurant, uh, Terry there, the owner who's been a long time, um, a long time Illinoisan and started the whole business there. He's the man who defied Pritzker's shutdown orders and said, you know what? We're Americans. We're not locking down. And fortunately, people responded in kind and, and, you know, helped that business stay alive during the COVID time frames. Of course, as far as we know, nobody got sick by going to Kai's. Um, they just went there and enjoyed themselves. Again, you can get the best steak and seafood in all of Glendale Heights right there at Kai's Restaurant. So we en encourage you to patronize both of those businesses. And we'll continue to give them a shout out to during our podcast. Thank you for being a sponsor with us. So let's go back to the lead story, which is Chicago mayor criticized for launching canned water brand amid the lead crisis. Thank you. Thank you for the Guardian for putting together this story because it is unreal. Lori Lightfoot launched Chicago's own brand of canned water under the name of Chicago. Uh, and she's may have created more waves than expected, according to the article. On Tuesday, this is actually an article from May 5th, but on Tuesday, the city mayor um, unveiled the artfully designed cans of Chicago water to celebrate their water source, Lake Michigan, in honor of National Drinking Water Week. I did not know we had a National Drinking Water Week. Well, I guess you learn something every day. Um, but the city has been identified as having potentially toxic lead pipes delivering that water to homes. More, and that's more homes than anywhere else in the United States. <laughs> so that's actually what locals should be concerned about. I mean, so she's launching Chicago water as a something that's clean and delicious for drinking waters. And yet 400,000 homes, which they've known about for a long time, have lead pipes that lead from the actual water that comes in through your street to the home. 400,000 homes you know what, you're not safe to drink the water there. And it's not like they didn't know this. They've known this for quite a while. I, I, you know, the Illinois Business Journal, they wrote an article about this. This was just in March, March 6, 2022. Um, Illinois has more lead pipes than any other state in the nation, but a new plan from the Biden-Harris administration could boost the state's lead line removal efforts. The Biden-Harris Lead Pipe and Paint Action Plan calls for $15 billion over the next decade to replace the country's lead pipelines. Uh, the Director of Safe Water Initiative for the National Resources Defense Council said financing lead line removal projects is a major barrier for most communities, and it certainly is. It's an expensive endeavor. I will tell you, when I sat on Wheaton City Council, it's something that we did. We didn't have lead pipes, but we had water pipes that needed to be replaced, so we did have to increase the water rate a bit and actually at that point we were under uh, our surrounding communities water rate so we raised it up a little bit to do what we should have that should have been done by previous councils which is replace your infrastructure on a regular basis so you have to do this chicago has ignored it this is not something national taxpayers should have to pay for this is not something state taxpayers should have to pay for this is something that the city of chicago and their democrat elected officials uh, absolutely ignored for year after year after year after year. Now, what's really troubling 
is that it is projected that it would take 50 years at the rate, at the current rate that they think that they can get the work done, 50 years to replace all 400,000 um, homes that have lead uh, um, pipes going to these 400,000 homes. I mean, that is, it, it's just an astronomical amount. Um, and looking at another article here that I thought was really important to see, uh, to read about, WTTW, which is a local radio station here, um, in April of 2022, they, they basically talked about the city push to replace 400,000 lead service line, and it stalled at 74. City crews have replaced just 74, 74 of the approximately 400,000 lead service lines responsible for contaminating Chicago's, Chicagoans' tap water in the 19 months after Mayor Lori Lightfoot declared that it was way past time to ensure Chicagoans have clean water in their homes. Okay, so do you, do you just think this is ridiculous? 74 lines. She announced 19 months ago, what, what work did they get done? 74 lines. They have 400,000 to go. And instead of like focusing on that, oh no, no, we have Chicago. Chicago, canned water brand. She, you can't make it up. I'm reading, continuing to read on from the WTTW, the Department of Water Management Commissioner Andrea Chang told a hearing of the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works chaired by Senator Tammy Duckworth that took place Thursday at the Shedd Aquarium that city officials remain committed to removing every lead service line in Chicago. The $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill approved in November of 2021 included $15 billion to fund lead service line replacement efforts and $3 billion is set to flow to states and cities in 2022. A Biden administration plan calls for all of the lead service lines to be removed in a decade. That would cost $45 billion. Yet, I, this, does this make sense to you? You have $1 trillion that you're going to spend on infrastructure. There's actually nothing more important, in my opinion, than safe water to drink. Nothing more important. They, in that $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill that the Democrats pushed forward, allocated $15 billion for lead service line replacement efforts. Then Biden says, all these pipes, these lead service lines need to be removed within a decade, but that would actually cost $45 billion. So I'd say the Biden proposal is about $30 billion short, not to mention you're spending $1 trillion on infrastructure and this is giving such short shrift. And instead you're spending literally hundreds of billions of dollars on renewable energy efforts that don't work. You cannot make this up. I just want to, you know, complete the picture here with the Democrats. One big talking point. Oh, we got Chicago. Chicago. Biden saying he wants to replace all the pipes in 10 in in 10 years, which by the way, I, it's it's unbelievable they haven't been replaced yet. And then they don't even fund it. And they have the money to fund it because they spent 1 trillion dollars on infrastructure, but this is not important enough infrastructure. You just I mean, I just hope Hopefully we're closing the loop here for some people. Hopefully we're connecting some dots on policy for these people. I, I certainly hope so. Reading on into the article a little bit further, the WW, WTTW article, um, uh, federal law banned, banned the use of lead pipes in 1986. Let me do a little math here. Oh gosh, what are we at? 14 and 20, that's 34 and two, 36 years ago. 36 years ago, federal law banned the use of lead pipes, and Chicago still has the highest in the nation, 400,000 lead service pipes. There is no safe level of lead in drinking water, according to federal officials. Lead is a neurotoxin and can be especially damaging to children and pregnant women. City officials estimate that it will cost $15,000 to $26,000 to remove lead service lines from each home or two flat in Chicago or $8.5 billion in all. So just for Chicago, we need $8.5 billion. Maybe Lori Lightfoot's plan is to actually sell enough of Chicago to replace all our lines. I don't know. She didn't say that. I doubt that that'll happen. But maybe that's her plan. Uh, in September 2020, Lightfoot said that the city would start by removing lead service lines from homes and two flats owned by low and moderate income neighborhoods with $15 million in federal grants. But that program has been slow to get off the ground. And only 54 homes 
that qualified for that effort have had their home's lead service line removed, according to data from the Department of Water Management. City officials have received at least 886 applications for the program, but just 262 have been approved, according to additional data. Under another program, homeowners willing to foot the entire bill for the lead service line replacement program can get 3,500 in fees waived if they complete the removal themselves. But 20 homes have had their lead service lines removed as part of the program. So 74 homes in total. They've known about this for 36 years. They decide to finally get on board, and their solution is to sell Chicago Michigan water to fund the program. I mean, I don't know. They have no solution here. It is outrageous, outrageous that, they, that the Democrats ignored a huge, massive problem for this long. Uh, so there you go. I hope I squared some dots for you, so squared some circles for you, connected some dots. Because if you don't have people in office who actually are going to make uh, pertinent decisions and, and, and hold and fund those important thing, pro projects, then you're going to get nowhere. And the Democrats are getting nowhere on this. Okay, uh, next topic we're going to talk about is other malfeasance dealing with the energy sector. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Okay, within this segment, the second part of it is I want to talk about Illinois Energy. Before I begin, though, another shout out to NetMotorCars.com and Michael Colby there, a 30,000 square foot showroom for you to pick out and select your luxury vehicle that you would like. Lots of financing available as well. And another shout out to Kai's Restaurant on North Avenue. Both of you, thank you for being sponsors to our big event, our second annual dinner and discussion with Dan Proft and John Cass. Uh, two of Illinois' best political pundits out there. So uh, we're going to have fun with uh, watching what, what they have to say on Friday night about Illinois. And they're going to answer the question, is this, year, this the year that Illinois will be turned upside down? I can't wait to see what they say about that one. Of course, that was Dan Proff's very, very clever um, um, meme or, 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 or discussion point when he ran for governor back in 2010. A lot's changed in 12 years. Okay, going back to energy, and of course, this is something that uh, this Breakthrough Ideas and I myself specifically have covered in depth many, many times, but it cannot be ignored. I've already talked to you before, and we've had state legislators on about the whole idea that downstate and, and central Illinois are expecting rolling blackouts. Ameren, who's their energy provider, flat out said, you know what, we don't think that we have enough capacity in our energy system to provide for all the needs come this summer when, you know, like people are going to want their air conditioning on. And they're not now the only ones saying it. Of course, first it came from Ameron and MISO, was the, which is the Mid-Continental, um, oh, I will figure that out here. Oh, the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator. They're the operators for, for the um, system down there in central and southern Illinois. But so they said it first, and we, we again highlighted this a good six weeks ago when it first came out. But now you've got articles in the Wall Street Journal. This is becoming a national story. And on May 8th, Wall Street Journal had this to say. They said, electricity shortage warnings grow across the United States. P their subtitle, Power Grid Operators Caution That Electricity Supplies Aren't Keeping Up With Demand Amid Transition to Cleaner Forms of Energy. Did you catch that? Transitioning to cleaner forms of energy is creating... Electricity shortages, why? Because when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, guess what? You don't have energy being produced. And so every time that that happens, you must have backup energy online. But in this state and in other states, they have said, ah, uh, we don't like fossil fuels. We're done with coal. We don't like, um, uh, you know, even natural gas. Okay, it's fine as a filler for right now, but eventually in the state of Illinois, we're going to get rid of natural gas. Really, does that now mean that you're going to replumb, repipe every single home? so that you can't use your natural gas stove and you have to go electric, you can't use your natural gas dryer, you can't use your natural gas he um, heater. Is that what they intend to do when they shut down natural gas in the state of Illinois, which they intend to do? No, that's actually not what's going to happen because they're all lying to you. 
It's all one big, huge, massive lie. These people are lying to you because there is no replacement right now for fossil fuels. They can pretend there is. There isn't. The wind and solar that they want to put on for capacity is insufficient to meet demand. That is the truth. And I wish these lefties and all these Dem Democrat suburban women, especially, who think this is the be all end all, would get a clue. But they don't. I'm reading more. Reading more from the Wall Street Journal article. Here you go. From California to Texas to Indiana, electric grid operators are warning that power generating capacity is struggling to keep up with demand, a gap that could lead to rolling blackouts during heat waves or other peak periods as soon as this year. California's grid operator said Friday that it anticipates a shortfall in supplies this summer, especially if extreme heat wildfires or delays in bringing new power sources online exacerbate the constraints. The mid Continent Independent System Operator, or MISO, which oversees a large regional grid spanning much of the Midwest, said late last month that capacity shortages may force it to take emergency measures to meet summer demand and flagged the risk of outages. In Texas, where a number of power plants lately went offline for maintenance, the grid operator warned of tight conditions during a heat wave expected to last into next week. There you have it, folks. They are already signaling that you are going to have outages. Have out, outages. However, <laughs> okay, J.B. Pritzker is going to be just fine. Because guess what? He's serviced by nuclear power for his electricity. And so are the suburban women Democrats who voted for this Illinois version of the Green New Deal that said we're going to shut down fossil fuels. And so J.B. Pritzker, doesn't matter if he goes up to Wisconsin, he goes down to Florida, he goes to his place in Chicago, his second mansion, maybe that one's got toilets back in it. I don't know yet. But anyway, anywhere J.B. Pritzker lives, he's going to have energy. Not so in central and southern Illinois because in 2019, he was already telling coal plants that, that I'm putting on higher regulations on you, and they did. And so henceforth, just in the last this year, you're having three coal plants go offline in the state of Illinois. Now, coal provides over 20% of our, our, our energy supply. A natural gas about the same amount. We get a little bit over 50% of our energy needs come from nuclear power. But that is powered up in the suburbs and in Chicago. The MISO region, which is suffering from a lack of power, is central and southern Illinois. And it has to do with this war on fossil fuels that the Democrats, including J.B. Pritzker, has created. Um, the challenges, going on to the Wall Street Journal article, the challenge is that wind and solar farms, which are among the cheapest forms of power generation, that's actually not true. They're not all in. They're not che the cheapest forms. That is not true. Don't produce electricity at times and need large batteries to store their output for later use. While a large amount of battery storage is under development, regional grid operators have lately warned that the pace may not be fast enough to offset the closures of traditional power plants that, cannot, that can work around the clock. So, th th I mean, that is the problem here. And, and you know, uh, they must be talking about taking into account all the credits, then wind and solar is cheaper, but that's not true otherwise. So, um, you know, Zero Hedge zeroed in on this as well. They said the same thing. And then we have this interesting article that I'd like to bring, on to, uh, bring to you. Maybe you guys remember this. Maybe you don't. But not that long ago, in fact, just a few months ago, uh, Rivian was given large amounts, about $50 million in state-funded tax credits to start up in the state of Illinois to create jobs and build their electrical vehicle plant in Bloomington Normal area. Okay, well, what does Wall Street Journal say about that? <laughs> and by the way, this is recent. This is Wall Street Journal, May 10th. Oh, that's today. <laughs> A high-speed electric vehicle crash. Companies that rise with the help of political subsidies can also fall by them. Um, that's Rivian. That's Rivian. We gave them large amounts of subsidies for this plant. Behold how electric vehicle manufacturer Rivian's high-flying stock is crashing to earth. Rivian shares fell another 20.88% on Monday to 22.78 after its stock lockup period for early investors expired. Oh. Okay, so the early investors got paid out. All right. The EV startup went public in November with a $66.5 billion valuation and shares of $78. Its stock price soon surged to $172 amid investor euphoria fed by free credit expectations that Congress would sweeten 
electrical vehicle subsidies. And in the state of Illinois, we have sweetened it. You, the, the Green New Deal that the Democrats passed, and unfortunately at least 11 surrender Republicans did and voted for it too, but that deal includes $4,000 tax credits for people who purchase an electrical vehicle. So this is all, all the electrical vehicle stuff is propped up by massive amounts of subsidies. Okay, at one point Rivian commanded a $153 billion market value more than every automaker in the world besides Tesla and Toyota despite having delivered a mere 156 vehicles before its IPO. But building a new automaker from scratch isn't easy. Tesla missed production forecasts early on and was only making 20,000 or so cars annually, five years after releasing its first model. Rivian's stock began to slide as it ran into manufacturing problems and investor hopes that Democrats would pass Build Back Better Faded. They're all looking for their goodies from Democrats in terms of subsidies. Rivian slashed its production guidance this year by half to 25,000 vehicles and raised the price of its pickup truck by $12,000 to $79,500. How many people in the state of Illinois can buy a $79,500 pickup truck to roll around their farm or go hunting with? Not very many, not very many. These electrical vehicles are out of touch, out of reach for most Americans. Prices of lithium and nickel for batteries have soared as government mandates have fueled an EV manufacturing boom. It may be a boom, but in the state of Illinois, I want to remind folks, there are still only about 38,000 electric vehicles. And that Green New Deal that they passed, their goal in Illinois is to have 1 million electric vehicles again by 2030. I've said this repeatedly on other podcasts. I just think it's important for us to track how well the Democrats are going to do with that. The answer is they're not going to do well at all. And you've got Rivian, which we gave $50 million in tax credits, just about $50 million in tax credits under the Round administration. And then they gave them additional tax credits and subsidies just last fall. Um, well, you're going to see this. This is not going to end up well for anybody. People aren't going to buy these cars. And then when they do, we're not even going to be able to have the energy, like I talked about earlier, to actually fuel these cars with electricity. It's just not going to happen. Nonsense. Okay. Uh, next segment coming up, we're going to talk about crime, and I'll be right back with you. Welcome back to The Real Story with Jeannie Ives. This segment's going to be about crime because it is a big issue. I tell you what, I, I just heard a story the other night where, again, in DuPage County, a man was just basically held up at, at gunpoint right here in DuPage County. Uh, now, I mean... So it, the crime's creeping over. It's, it's not just staying contained in any one spot. I mean, most people think that it's all about gang warfare in Chicago. No, it's rampant around the state. I got two stories I want to bring, with, bring up to you. First, though, uh, a little um, uh, discussion from Hey Jackass. I don't know if you've, I mean, I know, I know you may not like that, that word, but that's actually the name of this website. It's called Hey Jackass, and they, tra they actually track Chicago crime uh, fairly heavily. So year to date, year to date, shot and killed 188. Shot and killed, shot and wounded, 786, total shot, 974, total homicides overall, 209. So um, more homicides than, you know, most of them were from gunshot, but other ones for other reasons, strangulation, knives, you name it. Um, for the um, last weekend, Last weekend, final, and they, these guys are kind of like, they mock it, final peaceful tally, six killed, 19 wounded. Pretty sad. The weekend starts Friday at noon. It goes till 6 a.m. on Monday mornings. Uh, so, I mean, this is not a good trend, Chicago. Just in May alone, 18 shot and killed. 18 shot and killed. Well, one of those men, one of those men is a, a young man called Dakota Early. Well, I'm, you know, I apologize. He's not dead. He's not dead. He was shot and wounded. One of those men shot and wounded, but he's in severe, serious, um, serious situation. Uh, this article is a Lincoln Park robbery victim remains in critical condition after he was shot three times by a duo. A duo wanted in seven other Northside crimes. Uh, that's our issue. We have people out there who have committed crimes, who have committed felonies, and they are back out. Remember that crime bill. 
and we've talked about this before in our podcast, it's important to remind you because maybe this is the first time you're listening to my podcast. By the way, it's The Real Story with Jeannie Ives where we bring real issues to you. We connect the dots for, for folks so that they understand what's going on and we bring real experts in on our podcast many times. So in this case, um, Dakota Early is fighting as hard as he can right now, said his brother, uh, his brother wrote on Sunday. And this is from a Chicago Sun-Times article that I'm reading. His family says the 23-year-old is a gentle giant who wouldn't ha would have given the shirt off his back to anyone in need. On Friday, Early was robbed of his phone and shot, and shot three times in Lincoln Park in what the local alder person said was a shocking incident. So this isn't the west side of Chicago. This isn't the south side of Chicago. This is in Lincoln Park. He remains on life support and will have one of his feet amputated to save the rest of his leg. Dakota is fighting as hard as he can right now, his brother Deshaun Early wrote Sunday on a GoFundMe online fundraising page. Chicago police said Dakota was robbed and shot early Friday by two people wanted in at least seven similar robberies on the north side this month. Dakota Early was walking on a sidewalk at Webster and Wayne Avenues around 3 a.m., when he was confronted by a gunman, gunman who stepped out from behind a building, pointed a gun, and demanded his cell phone. Surveillance video sh shared with the website CWB, they're really good, Chicago, uh, that's a Chicago crime tracking um, site, captured him struggling with the gunman who took his phone and demanded the passcode. The gunman then opened fire at close range and shot him three times in the head and back. Police said he is, he is hospitalized at Illinois Masonic Medical Center. The gunman's accomplice could be seen getting out of a white car during the struggle. No one had been arrested as of Monday. That's yesterday. I'm recording this right now on Tuesday. Detectives are seeking tips from the public to identify the pair. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, anyway. Uh, it's, it's just so sad. How do you do this? Uh, going on in the story they talk about on Monday, Police Superintendent David Brown said the department was ramping up resources across the city in preparation for warmer weather that typically sees more violence. We are going to be very flexible in the way that we scale up our resources, so look for not only extra resources in Lincoln Park. We talked about the CTA. We've talked about downtown. We've talked about, we've talked, uh, about this focus on the 55 beats that drive shootings and homicides. So all of these areas, to include Lincoln Park, will see increased resources, according to him. Well, we'll see if that works. I don't have a whole lot of hope because we haven't seen it work so far. It's not going to work as long as Kim Fox is around to release these criminals on their own recognizance. And then you have Democrats who pass legislation, literally pass legislation, that if somebody is uh, uh, on a felony arrest and they are supposed to be wearing a home monitoring device, which means that the, the police can track them, that they are at home where they should be and they cannot leave that home, <laughs> they pass legislation to say that they get two free days a week. Two free days a week. Take the monitor off. Go wherever you want to. Commit crimes whenever you want to then and not be tracked. Does that make sense to anyone? No, it makes no sense at all. You're on home monitoring for a particular period of time. You get two free days to roam as you like. That's not home monitoring. But the Democrats all pass that. They all signed on to that. Think it's a great idea. I mean, these, these are some of the most stupid politicians we've ever had take office. And unfortunately, they're ruining people's lives. And Dakota Early is now on, you know, seriously wounded his leg amputated. This young man did not deserve to have that happen to him. But it's not just in Illinois. Here's an article from Illinois Times, a hit and run. What kind of man would run over me and my dog and leave us both for dead? For April Poole and Paula Harris, August 13th felt like any other Friday night. They attended Brothers and Sisters, a group of friends who gather for dinner each week at a different restaurant. And on this particular Friday, they dined somewhere on the west side. It was close to 9 a.m. when they headed home. As Poole turned north on MacArthur Boulevard, she noticed a few cars weaving impatiently through the heavy traffic. One of those impatient drivers in a light-colored SUV was behind her as she crossed South Grand. Poole was in the left lane, and as she neared Washington Park, the SUV swung into the right lane, cut back in front of Poole, and accelerated 
I'm looking to see if there's another car coming, she says, because on Friday nights I've seen this before where kids are chasing each other. As the SUV sped up, she realized the driver was turning left on Fayette Street. I wasn't sure he was going, really going to make it on four wheels. She says that's how fast he appeared to be going to me. With her window down, Poole heard a clonk. The heavy thud of a speeding vehicle crashing against something soft with a slightly metallic overtone. I'm thinking, oh my God, he's hit a kid on a bike. Because what I see coming up in the air is reflections off of something, she says. I couldn't even tell what he had hit. What the SUV had hit was my dog, Rosie, and me. The flashes pool guesses might have been my glasses, the necklace I was wearing, and Rosie's reflective leash. Poole followed the SUV and saw me lying in the gravel on the north side of Fayette. She parked close enough to shield me from other cars, stifling her age, urge to just keep driving in pursuit of that SUV. So, I, here's what you go through. You got people doing a hit and run down in Springfield. I know all the points where they're talking about in this article. It's actually a friendly neighborhood. It's not one where you would expect this to be happening. Uh, yet you've got hit and runs uh, happening all the time. Uh, now here's a couple other things. In the eight months since that night, uh, this the writer says, I found solace in two facts. First, that Rosie didn't die alone because her dog did end up dying. Several people were there to comfort her, and a passing motorist even stra stopped and donated her own dog's blanket to Rosie. The second may be more important. That's the knowledge that with her death, Rosie would help take an armed habitual criminal off the streets of Springfield. We knew who hit Rosie and me a few days after it happened. A high-quality security system caught the crash on video, and I shared that footage on social media. Car buffs instantly identified the SUV as a Porsche Can circa 2010-2014. It was actually 2012. No license plate was visible, but the extra dark tint on the windows set it apart. Some people in my, D some people in my DMs provide information on businesses that that distinctive Porsche frequented. One or more mentioned the driver by name. I asked all messengers to call Crime Stoppers and t told them WILD had put up a thousand dollar reward on the do uh, Rosie's behalf. By Tuesday morning, when Springfield police officers officers came to my house, we realized we had been hearing the same name. Okay. Uh, it was too almost too easy to believe it was a guy named Dexter Darnell Hughes. As one tipster told me, he was already on parole for a hit and run. That's what he does because he almost always has drugs on him so he can't stop. Weiss wouldn't tell me much about Hughes except that he was a well-known to Springfield PD. Typically refused to stop when they would try to pull him over, was usually armed and should be considered dangerous. He has a very extensive criminal history, and a lot of the crimes he's been involved in are very serious crimes, according to Detective Dan Weiss, who's with the Springfield PD. But as an old reporter, I couldn't resist the urge to dig into Dexter Hughes' history myself. With the help of a former colleague, I acquired enough court records and police reports to recognize that for a guy who's only 28 years old, Hughes is a fairly prodigious small-town outlaw. He was arrested for disorderly conduct aggravated battery, aggravated assault, and unlawful use of a weapon, all before he turned 18. As an adult, his charges include more than this, more of the same, plus DUIs, resisting arrest, and weapons violations. He has pleaded guilty to felony manufacturer delivery of a controlled substance, crack cocaine. He has so many incidences of reckless driving that I feel offended when anyone refers to our traumatic encounter as an accident. I'm not saying he intentionally ran over Rosie and me, but driving recklessly has, was standard operating procedures for Hughes, and he didn't seem to care if he happened to hit inanimate objects or living creatures. So this is the type of people that are left out of on the street by state's attorneys who refuse to do their job and put these people away. That's right. Whether it's Dakota Early in Chicago or this, uh, th this person here whose dog also died. I mean, the article goes on and on. This is Dusty Rhodes. He's a former staff writer at Illinois Times and a former reporter for NPR Illinois. Hey, NPR, maybe you'll cover this story. Maybe you'll cover more about the horrific crime bills that the Democrats pass because they are creating the criminals by not taking care of the criminals in the first place that have already identified themselves as criminals. And so this is what you get in this state. Okay, 
Thank you for joining my podcast. We have more segments coming up, um, is, but this ends this segment. Again, if you need a new car, looking for an SUV, please visit Michael Colby at netmotors.com. And if you're looking for a great place to have a nice dinner, go to Kai's Restaurant in Glendale Heights, the best steak and seafood in Glendale Heights. We're going to be talking with Mary Holland Fiorito. She is the attorney, public speaker, and commenter on all issues involving women's and women's leadership in the Catholic Church, work-life balance from others, and a number of other areas. We're going to have her on talking about exactly what this Roe opinion, this leaked draft means, and what has been the reaction, not just in Illinois, but really around the country. So we have more on that topic. But before I get to Mary, I want to actually, uh, again, introduce our sponsors for our event on May 13th. It's with John Cass and Dan Proft, and we have great sponsors ships from Michael Colby with netmotors.com. Of course, that's where you would want to go if you want to find your SUV. They've got a 30,000 square foot uh, warehouse uh, with all sorts of models and makes that you can imagine. And on top of that, they have got excellent financing available to their customers. Again, you'll want to check out Michael Colby. Uh, he is ready and willing to take care of all of our listeners. And on our other, our other sponsor is Kai's Restaurant in Glendale Heights. They are the best place to go find good steak and fresh seafood and uh, Kai's were the ones if you remember they're the ones who stood up to Governor Pritzker in his lockdown order and basically said put it right up on their marquee we're Americans we're not shutting down uh, love them for that uh, they have a great following there you can if, if you want my opinion uh, their French onion soup is terrific and so are their steak sliders that would be my recommendation if you go there but again, thank you to our sponsors for our event this Friday, this Friday, May 13th. We are sold out at this point, but um, we appreciate everybody who's going to be there. So now let's get into the podcast because this is a really important topic, and we're talking with a really an expert, uh, Mary Holland Fiorito. Uh, again, she's an attorney and a public speaker on all sorts of issues. She actually was, um, in addition, she was the Cardinal Francis George Fellow. Uh, so she's very familiar with uh, the legal issues surrounding abortion, the legal issues surrounding anything that, that deals with this topic. Uh, she's a Catholic herself. She understands everything from a Catholic perspective. But more importantly, she understands things from a legal, ethical perspective. And she's very in touch with what's happening uh, culturally across the United States when it comes to this topic. Mary, thank you for coming on to my program. Oh, my pleasure, Jeannie. Always a great joy to be with you and your listeners. Yes, and we've had you on before, so it's it's refreshing to talk to you about this. So a couple things that I want to really focus on, and I think there's been a lot said about this topic already, but you're getting even more vitriol coming out of the left on this topic. So Lori Lightfoot basically goes and, and, and says things like, you know, it's a call to arms on everything else. Uh, and she's, of course, excoriated rightfully, but she literally tweeted out to my friends in the lgbtq plus community the supreme court is coming for us next this moment has to be a call to arms and she says this when she knows that there are protesters going out and protesting literally in the neighborhoods where supreme court justices live i mean mm -hmm. how what is i mean i i've i've heard i haven't read the statute myself i've heard there's federal laws preventing this maybe some of these people should be investigated and arrested just like you had insurrectionists uh quote unquote insurrectionists at the january 6th time frame um arrested for them trying to uh you know influence uh, uh improperly public decisions by public officials i don't know this seems really uh taking it too far yeah well it's, it's judicial intimidation genius what okay. it is and can you imagine say we're in the civil rights era right and you have judges who would have voted to end segregation or to open up voting rights to African Americans, and and the Ku Klux Klan went outside those judges' homes and you know threatened them um, in in a different you know in a, in, a, in a variety of different ways. Imagine how crazy the left would go if that happened, and or rightfully so. Judges, you cannot have this kind of judicial um, intimidation and certainly not threats. Uh, against their safety, uh, the safety of their children. I saw a video this morning um, from outside of uh, Justice Samuel Alito's home, and there were people marching back and forth in front of his home with, you know, horrible, gory signs, et cetera, et cetera, um, while his next-door neighbor um, opened all the windows of his house and played on the question hymn while they were marching because he said he wanted to drown out 
you know, evil with good. So that, you know, you, you, you do have people who are trying to step up and, and uh, protect those who are being, um, again, intimidated and threatened. But, you know, we saw what happened in Catholic churches across the country right. this past weekend. There was a tabernacle stolen. And for your listeners who aren't Catholic, we believe that the, the Eucharist, the host that we receive at Mass on Sundays and sometimes during the week, um, but that's the actual body and blood and soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. So that's why it's kept in a special uh, you know, box, if you will, called the tabernacle, with a lock and key, is to protect it from being desecrated um, or abused in some way. And some of these radical groups have said they will try to steal a host at a Catholic mass in order to to, de- to desecrate it and to uh, you know destroy it or to do something horrible to it. And so, for us as Catholics, it just strikes to the heart of who we are as a Christian people. And, but it also doesn't you know, make sense. I mean, Joe Biden is ostensibly Catholic, even as he right. is. Oh, he's not, a devout Catholic. Yeah, yeah according to, me, according to his devout. words, he is. But right, I mean, I right. don't think anybody who really is a devout Catholic would say by his actions and his words that he's a devout Catholic. And so right. this vitriol that is actually then targeted towards Catholic, the Catholics is just it's, it's just nonsensical. No, it, it it makes that that you know the the basis apparently for this kind of targeting of Catholics mm-hmm. is that of the five justices right, in the of least, my, majority opinion, um, for what well, they they say all of them are Catholic. That's actually not true. Justice Gorsuch is, I think, Episcopalian. He's Protestant of some sort. He's not mm-hmm. Catholic. He went mm-hmm. to Catholic schools. So you know, but don't let let's As not do let Jewish that, people and way, Muslim right? people and other other people who want right. a good education. They they go to Catholic right. schools as well. We, we, you know, every, you know, there's all sorts of people who are Catholic who are educated right. in our schools, but they don't want to. You know, let's not get the, let the facts get in the way of our our press. Well, that is right? the they, problem. They, yeah. And okay. So let, let's let's yeah. turn to that. Let's not get the facts get in the way of our opinions. And so yeah. here, this is this is actually I find just dumbfounding. I mean, I just I just can't even believe it. But if you look at uh, Governor Pritzker's press release about uh, speaking out again about the overturning of Roe v. Wade, uh, I mean, he's just. He's just basically condemning it. He literally says the terrifying implications of this decision and what it means for millions of women across the country cannot be understated. Let me be clear. No matter what atrocity of an opinion the Supreme Court officially rolls out this summer in regards to Roe versus Wade, abortion will always be safe and legal here in Illinois. Illinois is and will remain a beacon of hope in an increasingly dark world. I will fight like hell. I mean, okay, first of all, terrifying implications. We are the abortion capital right. already of, um, of the Midwest. And, and right. you know, it's expected to be 20,000 to 30,000 more people will flee from other states to get their abortion here in Illinois. And yet this is terrifying to him. I mean, it, so, so there, he's, he's actually, he's making it sound like abortion goes away with this ruling. It doesn't. It returns to the states and in the state of Illinois that he governs over in which he has made really, truly one of the most uh, extreme, and I hate to overuse that word, but it is true, one of the most extreme uh, states for abortion services. Uh, I mean, he, this is just an overreaction. This is not This is not rooted in truth anything in any way. Well, he, you know, I think this is going to be a winning issue uh, in the polls. It's and, not. It's um, not. It's, I, correct, Jeannie. So when you when you poll most Americans, if mm-hmm. you, you just say you can ask the effort, you know, one of those men on the street or whatever, they how, how reputable polling it, um, agencies would poll people and say, do you support the overturning of Roe versus Wade? Now, first of all, there's a pretty significant percentage of people who don't know that Roe versus Wade is an abortion decision. So they don't even know what you're asking them. But secondly... I'm not surprised, by the way. Yeah, well, of course not. We don't have a particularly well-educated um, in terms of, you know, constitutional law, general, pop, you know, popula- population and public. So many Americans, in fact, kind of a slight majority will say, um, no, I want to keep Roe versus Wade the law of the land. But they don't know that Roe versus Wade and its, com- and its companion case, Doe versus Bolton, and a subsequent decision called Planned Parenthood versus Casey, those decisions, those three decisions combined, legalized abortion in the United States for the entirety of a woman's pregnancy. And we are only one of seven countries in the world mm-hmm. that permits elective abortion, so healthy mom, healthy baby, elective abortions after 20 weeks. And the, even the Washington Post fact check this with their Pinocchio check mark. You know, I don't uh-huh. know if anybody's okay, great. familiar with that. They, they found it. They said it was surprisingly yeah. true. So we're right it's up there true. with China so, and North Korea. China, North Korea, Canada, oddly enough. But the, the majority of the civilized world, including virtually every country, 
uh, limits abortion to the first trimester only. That's where most Americans are comfortable at well, this point. I'm not saying morally I agree with that, but that's where most yes, people are. And they that are. Is certainly not what Roe versus Wade Well, and Roe, if you even yeah. we know this from polling that was done in the specific to the state of Illinois, in the state of Illinois, 66 percent of respondents in a poll that was taken about a year ago have said that they believe uh, abortion should be limited to the first trimester. 72 percent of them believe that parents should have a right to know. Of course, they got did away with that in the state of Illinois. Uh, a majority right. of them absolutely don't believe in taxpayer funding of abortion, which we provide for in the state of Illinois. I mean, so it gets even worse. And then the, Missis- the Mississippi case for which this reversal on Roe v. Wade is being based, they have a, they only put in a 15-week abortion ban, which is in line with France. Correct. It's no different right. than and, France. Right. And you heard the, the Chief Justice, you know, during oral arguments in the Dobbs case back in December saying, why isn't that enough time? I don't understand. What, that's, that's practically to the four-month mark in terms of pregnancy. Mm-hmm. You know, why isn't that enough time? And the other side, of course, couldn't give a direct good answer to that. But I, I, I want to just touch on two of the points you just sure. made, Jeannie, because they're super important for this upcoming election. Um, in, in that, first of all, you mentioned that Governor Pritzker signed a bill which repealed a law that required abortionists and abortion clinics to notify parents if they were going to do an abortion on a minor girl. Pritzker has lied about this many times. I, I can't, you know, he tweets this out once or twice a day even sometimes about his, you know, his great stand for women and trust women. Well, how about trusting parents? I mean, trust parents, JB. I have three daughters, two of them are teenagers. I can't take that ears pierced, you know, to, they can't have an aspirin in school without my not, without my permission, much less my knowledge. But he has now undone this law. He keeps lying about his reason for it. I've seen him prevaricate on this so many times. I, I'm surprised. I think only one reporter, Marianne Ahern, won her in one conference Last week, called him out on it, and he dodged the question and wouldn't answer it. He keeps claiming he wanted to protect abused girls from having to tell their abusive parents that they were going to have an abortion. So there's two different lies there. First of all, it, the law never required the child to tell the parents. The law does not put that onus on the child. It's on the abortion clinic. The abortion clinic had to notify parents. Secondly, it, there was a blanket waiver for girls. All girls had to do was to a test in writing saying, I'm a victim of, say, for example, incest or, uh, mm-hmm. you know, physical abuse at home. All she had to do was sign a, an affidavit saying, I need I need this abortion. I cannot tell my parents because I'm a victim of abuse. There was a waiver in the law. So he claims to be looking out for girls who were already protected by the law um, that, that operated for the vast majority of parents in the state of Illinois who had a right to know that their parents are, you know, their child is going to have irreversible surgery. But takes the life of their grandchild, by the way, but let's not even get into that particular piece of it. No one has a right to touch your child, much less do surgery on them without telling you. I I cannot emphasize this enough. And, you know, I I spoke at a press conference last week at the Dobbs League, and I had two or three different reports. I have any idea that this happened. When did this happen? And Pritzker signed the bill very quietly on the Friday before Christmas. You know, Yeah, nice Christmas present. Nice Christmas yep, present. Was, oh, by yep. the way, um, Anna Moeller, Democrat yes. state representative yeah. from the Elgin area, uh, actually right. represents a, a nearly a majority of her district is Hispanic, supposedly fa- family valued, uh, you know, Hispanic folks, Catholic going, all oh, the whole thing. And and this is her nice Christmas present to her constituents right. was, was right. You know, repeal of um, parental notice of abortion. And they right. don't know it. We're going to let them know it because Anna yep. Moeller needs to be put out of office over this issue alone. I mean, she yep. doesn't care about parental oh, rights. Powerful. This is much more yep. a parental rights issue than it is an abortion issue. Uh, as yep. that, I mean, honestly, it, it really is. It is an abortion issue, don't get me wrong, but it's really a parental rights issue. And if you're Correct. not going to tell our about parents right. to know about this, then, you know, forget it. Yeah. So well, the law didn't make any particular abortion legal at all. It, all it did was require abortionists or abortion clinics mm-hmm. to notify parents. It didn't make any type of, it didn't mean the abortion clinic couldn't go forward with the abortion. All they had to right. do was to give notice. That was it. And so, you know, this is, this is when we polled, as you kind of alluded to, uh, 72% of Illinois parents, including, I think, something like 40% of people, percent of people who said they were pro-choice, wanted to keep that law intact. And one of the, you know, I testified in front of the Illinois House Committee. Anna Moeller was on that committee when I testified. Yeah. I mean, the, the, it was, and they gave our side, the pro-life side, I think an hour to get ready. So it was me against 
six different people on the abortion side, including an abortionist from the Hope Clinic downstate in Granite City, a judge who signs judicial bypass um, rulings for, you know, girls who need to get a judicial bypass to get this. So I, it was completely stacked. They were all reading from scripts, et cetera. And there was me. I had an hour to get ready. I mean, you, but as you mentioned, I've been doing this issue for a long time, so I could certainly hold my own with them. But that's how stacked all of this was. Like, we, could, well, we didn't even have just, time. Yeah. No, yeah, it's just, they, they're just playing, they're playing yeah. cover for, for state representatives that have no ethical or moral compass whatsoever. Right. And they're just right. playing cover. Well, the experts said, you know, we got right. six experts well, on that side. I mean, this, yeah, well, this is what the games yeah. they play. It's, it's outrageous. Right. And one of the things where they said that, um, that, that public sentiment and experts were on their side is in the area of the sex trafficking of minors. And we had a terrific on our side, a woman named Brooke Bello, who was trafficked from the time she was 11 until she was 18 or 19. And three times while she was still a minor, again, she was trafficked starting from the age of 11, she was brought to abortion clinics by her traffickers. And abortions were done on her without her parents being notified because they went to states, right, as you would imagine they would, yeah. that had no requirement to notify parents. And she said, she, we, we had a press conference. She spoke to all the members of the General Assembly. She said, please do not overturn this law. She said, if one of those clinics had had a requirement to call my parents, my mom, the state I was in, yeah. and she could have found me. I start crying every time I think about it because you think this poor kid and these traffickers taking her to abortion clinics. This is what JB has now enabled starting June 1st of 2022, the case in Illinois, yeah. any trafficker, any abuser, any, you know, whoever can, can, can take a girl for an abortion and no one needs to call her parents and even tell them that she's there. I just can't believe, I, I cannot believe that this is how indebted and embedded to the, you know, in the abortion industry, J.B. Prisker is. It is disgraceful and it just is completely well, I mean, if this is antithetical his, if, to what parents if, want. If this is his way of, you know, improving the economics of our state by having more people come over for an abortion, uh, shame on him because again, I want to I yep. want to reemphasize this. In the state of Illinois, there is a presumption of eligibility for Medicaid if you present as pregnant at the time that you need medic want or look for Medicaid services. Given that, which means there's a presumption of eligibility, which means that you know for the first 60 days they don't really go back and verify income status, residency status, or anything else. So a lot of those abortions could easily be paid for by Illinois taxpayers, even though they're for, for women and girls that are out of the state because of this presumption of eligibility for Medicaid Correct. services and because we now in the state of Illinois, oh, via, uh, you know, Republican uh, Bruce Rauner's hand, uh, put in place right. taxpayer funding of abortion. I mean, this is it's horrible. Hey, I right. want to yeah. yep. change. I, I want to uh, go to a different topic. I don't know if you were able to listen to Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's uh, conversation that she had with Tim Scott when they were in committee on this particular topic. But it is it's it's alarming and it actually sends chills up some. It, it should send chills up people's spines. And it's very, very close to what Margaret Sanger's aim was, which was for population control and racial perfection. And, uh, you know, Sanger, of course, famously saying more children from the fit and less from the unfit. That is the Correct. chief aim of birth control. And, of course, uh, she is the founder of parent, uh, Planned Parenthood. For, to her, birth control um, is, you know, is, is, you know, abortion is a form of birth control to them. And so this, you know, it, it, given what Margaret Sanger has said in the past, to hear what Janet Yellen says, and I'm going to play this three-minute clip, and then we'll have a little conversation about it. But I Correct. think it sh yep. should alarm everybody that we have people um, at, in high offices saying this about um, uh, this particular topic. Go ahead, uh, JP, if you can play that clip, that'd be great. Did you say that ending the life of a child is good for the labor force participation rate? Giving someone the access, let me just quote what you said, that ultimately increasing access to abortion uh, and re reproductive health care allows for our labor force participation rate to continue to increase, that denying women access to abortion increases their odds of living in poverty or need for public assistance as a guy who was raised by a single mom who worked long hours to keep us out of poverty. I think people can disagree on the issue of being pro-life or, or, or pro-abortion, but in the end, I think framing it in the context of labor force participation is 
it just feels callous to me. I, I think uh, finding a way to have a debate around abortion in a, a, a meeting for the economic stability of our country is harsh. Uh, and I'm just surprised that we find ways to weave into every facet of our lives such, such an important and painful reality for so many people to make it sound like it's just a, another 0.4% added to our labor force participation as a result of the issue of abortion just to me seems harsh. And well, I, I certainly don't mean to um, say what I think the effects are in a manner that's harsh. What we're talking about is um, whether or not women will have the ability um, to regulate their reproductive um, situation in ways that will enable them to plan lives that are fulfilling and satisfying for them. And one aspect of the satisfying life is being able to feel that you have the financial resources to raise a child, that the children you bring into the world are wanted and that you have the ability to take care of them. In many cases, um, abortions are of teenage women, um, particularly low income and often black, who um, aren't in a position to be able to care for children, have um, unexpected pregnancies, and it deprives them of the ability often to continue their education to later participate in the workforce. So there, there is a spillover into labor force participation, yeah. but, yeah. and uh, it means that children will grow up in poverty yeah. and do, do worse themselves. Thank and you. Let me, let me is, just this claim is my not time harsh. on the topic. This I, is the truth. I'll just simply say that as a guy raised by a black woman in abject poverty, I'm thankful to be here as United States. Okay. Okay, so uh, do, does, shouldn't we have a problem with what she essentially insinuated? Yeah, isn't it, isn't it nice when the other side just does our work for us? Yes, we, absolutely. We I mean, I, to me, it's not even out. insinuation. I'm she sorry. essentially yeah. said that we don't need any more poor black kids. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, and, and, you know, Jeannie, this has always been sort of a subset of beliefs among, mm -hmm. you know, elite, wealthy white people that our, our good friend Dan calls, you know, champagne socialists who live in million-dollar homes and et cetera, et cetera. And they're, they're very interested in guaranteeing the right of, of, of abortion to poor black people, aren't they? You know, and, um, uh, you know, of course, this was an initiative. This was a belief of Margaret Sanger, Planned Parenthood yes. founder, mm -hmm. um, as you, you quoted her. Um, and, you know, even Ruth Bader Ginsburg made a comment one time, you know, the populations that we don't want too many of. Um, when I was, I just remember, it, you know, when I was a young student without collecting signatures to try to turn the publicly funded abortions at Cook County Hospital. At that time, Cook County had, had a long-standing policy that they did not do elective abortions um, with public funds, just because the public didn't. It was an elective procedure, et cetera, et cetera. Number of people, I was just, you know, I was just so naive, I guess, who said, listen, I would rather do this now than have to pay welfare for these people later. And it was said just like that, welfare I... for these people. So, you know, I, I mean, it's just astounding what now passes for sort of polite commentary when really you're saying you're, you're talking about just eliminating the poor because they're too much of a problem eliminating right. you know special needs people because god forbid we have we have to take care of someone who has a dependency on others i mean is this who we are as americans this is you know i just think are you people even listening to you? do you know what this sounds like so i'm really glad that Je janet yellen clip has gone as viral as it has because it's it's shocking but it, you know but on the other hand they're making it clear who they are. And like Maya Angelou used to say, when, when people tell you who they are, believe them. Absolutely. And they're telling us who they are, and we need Absolutely. to wake up and to believe them. So thank you for drawing attention to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I, I don't know um, how people are going to react to this, um, but uh, honestly, I think this is this is more the story than the, than the rest of the story. 
this is how they really Correct. present. Right. They, this is what they do feel about people in these situations. That there's no recovery, exactly. there's no way to work your way out of this. I mean, and, but, and there's numerous examples where you can look at in history uh, of, of people that have succeeded who have, have come from like some of, the, like the Senator Tim Scott said, abject poverty. Oh, but I mean, they, they, they deny the humanity yeah. of all these individuals. Exactly. And, and it leaves, you know, this is what America does best, right? It can take mm-hmm. someone born into abject poverty and make them a Supreme Court justice. I mean, Clarence Thomas was born into a home that had no indoor plumbing. That's how poor they were. And, you know, after his, his, mom, his mom was a single mom, he had him and his brother. And, uh, how about Ben Carson? Had, Dr. Ben Carson. Yeah, Ben Carson's another one. I mean, we could come up with <laughs> We could go examples, on and on. But, you know, I, I, I just remember, you know, I watched that excellent documentary on Clarence Thomas that was on PBS. And even if you disagree with his journey, the liberal, you have to look at his life story and say, this is a man of great accomplishment. And, you know, a, lot, a big part of it was that, his mother, you know, she was a single mom. She said, I can't, I can't raise two boys by myself. I, they mm-hmm. need a father figure. And so right. they, the Clarence and his brother went to live with their grandparents. He always talks about being his grandfather's son, but the grandparents, who were black Catholics, sent them to a Catholic school. And, you know, Clarence at one point turned in kind of, uh, you know, mediocre work. And the nun who was his teacher said, I don't ever want to see this from you again, Clarence. You are, this, you are capable of far more than this. And I better not see this kind of laziness again. And that like woke something up in him, right? And she said he loved, she, she loved, this sister loved us. And we knew she loved us. And she loved mm-hmm. us enough to demand work for us. And well, I mean, so here's the here's the, the bottom line is, is that they, they do see children as a burden. They have a different outlook about children and human potential than a lot of us do on, on the pro-life yeah. side. Or, and, and, and rationally, it makes no sense. My reveille this week, and I hope people listen to my reveille, was about Leonard Reed, who was the founder of the Foundation for Economic Education. And he wrote he's the one who wrote that, you know, infamous eye pencil genealogy. Right. So he describes about how how, like no one into one person could make a pencil because the inputs to just something as simple as a pencil are so diverse that there's not a single person who has every input that's possible to make from the tree to the graphite to the lacquer on it to like you take every little uh, bit of what it took to make a pencil and literally thousands of people to actually make a simple pencil. So while his article was sort of about the division of labor and the invisible hand of the marketplace, he actually, he actually becomes very philosophical in this, uh, this uh, essay. And he says, you know, it has been said that only God can make a tree. Why do we agree with this? Isn't it because we realize that we ourselves could not make one? Right. He says, what right. mind is there among men that could even record, let alone direct, the constant changes in molecules that transpire in the lifespan of a tree? Such a feat is utterly unthinkable. Going on, he says in that same essay, he says, since only God can make a tree, I insist that only God could make me. Right. I mean, exactly. that's, that, just... that is at, at, you mean, at its core. The left's assault on the pro-life movement and and the Supreme Court justices, quite frankly, is is really an assault on reason and wonder. Yeah, and science. I mean, they yeah, claim to be the great people of science, science right? Yes. But but you know, I, I it astounds me. I mean, first of all, you know, we were speaking at the outset about the press conference Governor Pritzker had today, and um, the, the 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 way they are able to completely ignore all sorts of biological realities. It's rather breathtaking. I mean, we were, they were talking about women and, but I thought, Okay, so first of all, for our listeners, Governor Pritzker had a press conference today and he had it in a Planned Parenthood. Right, right. A Planned Parenthood clinic in Fairview Heights, which was built secretly. In fact, at the time it went up, Mm -hmm. there was an actual national CBS news story. Believe it or not, they built it secretly. Um, you know, and, and, and Fairview Heights for, for listeners is right near the Missouri border because this is Correct. one of the five Planned Parenthoods after Ron or signed taxpayer funding of abortion. They knew that they would be getting an influx of people coming in from other states. And so they, they saw this on the horizon. I think everybody thought that at some point Roe would be uh, overturned. And so they, they put these they put Planned Parenthoods literally.
literally in Flossmoor, 10 miles from the Indiana border. Waukegan, which is just by the Wisconsin border. Fairview Heights, which is right across from Missouri. So they've, they've got these Planned Parenthoods strategically located to take advantage of us being the abortion capital of the U.S. Right. So anyway, he's at a, a press cow. conference. Yeah. Yes, it's a cash yep. cow for Illinois, Planned Parenthood. Illinois is an abortion cash cow for Planned mm-hmm. Parenthood. Yes. And even if Roe had not been overturned, they would still have built those clinics, as yes. you mentioned, strategically placed at the borders because, as you also mentioned, presumed eligibility and Medicaid allows any pregnant person to come over, I, I, look, I'm using their language now, pregnant woman or pregnant girl right. to come over the border and have an abortion for free. And mm-hmm. so Illinois taxpayers are footing the bill. And in fact, in the first year, as you mentioned, that Governor Rauner signed, within a year of him signing that bill, permitting taxpayer-funded abortions, they increased 1,750%. And it must have even gone up since then. And now that we have all Oh, wait, it's about to get worse, though. Did you hear Lori Lightfoot? Her response was basically, we're going to spend a half a million dollars to assist girls from other states to come to to Illinois to have an abortion. We're going to she basically she committed a half a million dollars of taxpayer money just to Mm -hmm. for the transportation needs of right. girls in other states to come have an abortion here in Illinois. I mean, and, you can't get more ridiculous than these people. No, well, and and my goodness, where Unethical. are your priorities? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, you have you are running a city where people are terrified to go downtown now, where businesses are pulling out of major shopping districts like yeah. the Magnificent Mile, Michigan Avenue, um, in you know Oak Brook near where I live. Um, major retailers have now pulled out of the Oak Brook Mall. There was a family carjacked yeah. at the Oak Brook Mall on a Sunday afternoon at one afternoon. I mean, Yes, we things, covered that in an know, earlier podcast, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, astounding um, crime and poverty and everything else, and this is what she's worried about, us paying now to bring people here to Illinois to avail themselves of free abortions. And, you know, when you look at Illinois as a whole, and this is where I, I, I wish Pritzker would get called out a little more by reporters, is that we, we rank like, we used to be like 47th or 48th in the country in terms of the 50 states, um, for our uh, availability to provide services to the people with disabilities, yes. including children. Yes, that's true. I think we've crept up. We may be. Uh, like we, I think four, we're like four, four, four or now. something. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're still in. We're still in the bottom ten. No, you know, yes. And, uh, mm-hmm. uh, easily. And so here you have families who have special needs children, or they're caring for a special needs adult with cognitive disabilities, and they have to move across the border to Wisconsin or to Indiana because they cannot raise they cannot raise that child or, or care for that disabled adult. In, in a climate where the state does nothing to help support these families. But yet yeah. we're paying for everybody's abortion. Yeah. Where are the priorities? It is disgraceful how, what, what they believe that, you know, this is something that the majority of people in the state do not want. We don't want sex traffickers coming here. We don't want people coming in for tourism abortions. But people have to, you know, everybody has to take responsibility. Yeah. Tell a neighbor, tell a no, friend. I mean, look, tell, you can get you know, your abortion, your pot, and you can gamble all at the same time, right. all within a mile right, of each exactly. other. That's, yeah. I mean, and that's what, really, that's what, what we're, we're going to put base our economy on because here's the right. problem and here's really the bottom line. And then we'll close out this, this podcast, which I really enjoyed uh, this discussion. But I mean, honestly, here's the bottom line. Get, you know what? People are, are already fleeing the state of Illinois over tax rates, but they are even more so going to flee the state over the type of unethical, uh, 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 you know, rules that they have. Uh, the type of right. unethical things that they make us pay for, the type of yep. corruption that they right. may, that it, that we're forced to pay for as well. I mean, this is these are going to be these these uh, sort of non-economic issues are really going to be other reasons that people leave the state of Illinois. Right, and and don't believe you know this sort of tone and, and the statements that are coming out of Pritzker and Juliana Stratton and all those Ugh. Democratic representatives that, that they're really here to stand with women that they want you know they're they're the great compassionate there is nothing compassionate about offering <laughs> well, there's, a free abortion no there, there there's That's not right. and then on top of right? it in his 2019 reproductive health act they t- they took the word woman out of the entire act oh right no exactly we have so, so there is i mean there they finally language, now they yeah. care about women you, t- you, right. sh- you yeah. struck that you struck that word out of your right. 2019 Reproductive Health Act. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, now, now men can have joke. babies, and also, again, this is just another part of them. I, I just don't feel like I'm living in reality. Time. I feel like I, no. I'm living in one of the dumbest states in the, in the, in the in, that's ever been oh. put together. Uh, these people are dumb. They're, 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 they're honestly, I, they are. They're, they're dumb. They're, uh, they're. Um, 
They're idiots. Uh, they have no idea how to run a state. I, the, the, our energy policy is screwed up. Our tax policy yeah, is screwed up. I mean, everything is yeah. a mess here. Yeah. And and uh, they get their lies. They're they're just lies. I just I don't know. Yeah. Voters, well, voters, you know twenty twenty two. It's yeah. do or die in Illinois. Yeah. Well, Jeannie, no, actually, one thing I might disagree with you. I don't think they're they're dumb. I think they think we're dumb. That's what they know yeah. exactly what they're doing. They know. Yeah, exactly they're what they're, they're counting on the voters to be very, very busy trying to just beat inflation yep. um, at yep. their on their kitchen yep. table. Just trying to fill their to, tasks, Yeah, and right? just go with a familiar name on the ballot. We can't, you know, voters can't not do that this year. So uh, we're, we're yeah. here to provide information and and input in the process, and that's what we're about at Breakthrough Ideas. And uh, the real story with Jeannie Ives is about bringing real people like you on, Mary. And I, I, I really appreciate your time today talking about this really oh, important issue. Um, it's been a, a very informative, and um, I hope this goes viral too. Oh, I, I, I do as well. And, you know, it's, it is so important that people know the actual facts. I'm so grateful to you for, for making that possible. For, for people who want to learn more and want to learn in an unbiased fashion what's actually going on in the state. So I, 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 I wish every day that you had won instead of Rauner, but, you know, we're, we got to play the hand that we've been dealt here, Jeannie. And, um, but thank you for continuing to use your gifts to, to make people aware of what's happening, especially parents of girls. Terrific. All right. Uh, we'll say goodbye to Mary Holland Fiorito. It won't be the last time we have her on a podcast, but thank you for joining me today.